quick, what can you tell me about this 32-bit floating point value? In episode 18, we talked about, or we introduced, IEEE 754 floating point notation for both single precision, 32-bit, and double precision, 64-bit. And we talked about how when you get a number like this, you have to divide it or partition it up into its pieces to figure out what number we're representing. So the first bit, this guy was our sine bit. And then the next eight bits, this was our exponent in bias notation. And in, 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 whenever we did single precision, this bias notation was bias 127. I'll show you how that worked in the formula. And then we had these remaining 23 bits. This was our mantissa. We represented that with f. And so all we needed to do was substitute into the expression plus or minus 1.f times 2 to the e minus 127. And so that minus 127 was what gave us our bias for our exponent e. All right, so what does this guy equal? Well, the s is a 1, so we know that it's a negative number. Then it is assumed that we always have a point, one point. There is a case, a couple of cases, where we don't do that. But right now, we're going to assume there is a one point. And then the f. Well, in our case, this f is just 1, 1, followed by all zeros. So that's just simply 1, 1. Then we diode times 2. What is E equal to in unsigned binary? Well, it's 128 plus 1, that's 129. So we have 129 minus 127. So our actual value is 1 point, excuse me, negative 1.11 times 2 to the 2. Now, by multiplying by 2, remember what that's doing. Every time we multiply by 2, we take this point, this binary point, and move it one position to the right. Since we multiply by 2 twice, that moves it to the right twice, and we get negative 111 point. What is that equal to? Well, this is a 1, this is the 2, this is the 4, so this is equal to, in decimal, negative 7. Now, just by looking at the number, we should be able to figure out a couple of characteristics. Before we do, though, let's talk a little bit about some of the reserved values for IEEE 754 notation. Now, there are two primary mechanisms used whenever we're trying to reserve special cases for these floating point values, and that is the exponent, E, and then the mantissa, that's F, right? Now, the special cases are these. First of all, whenever the exponent is equal to all zeros, it's equal to all zeros. Well, that is, whenever you look at the bias notation, and let me go ahead and put the formula up here. So we have plus or minus 1.F times 2 to the e minus 127. And so when the exponent e is equal to zero, then the exponent we're raising two to is negative 127, the smallest possible value we can have. So looking at zero here, that would mean that we're trying to make it the smallest value possible. If the mantissa is equal to zero, well, this special case means that we're actually representing zero. Now, turns out we're representing plus or minus zero because this sign bit could be a one or a zero. But in the computer, in the processor, plus or minus zero, they're both equal. Plus zero is equal to minus zero. All right, so whenever the exponent and the mantissa, whenever we have all zeros here and all zeros here, what we're representing is zero. If, however, what we've got is a zero for our exponent, but the mantissa is not equal to zero, this turns out is a special case. And this special case is what we're referring to as denormalized. All right, denormalized. And really it means, you know, we'd, re we'd like to see how small a value we can represent with this floating point notation. So this special case, whenever the exponent is absolutely as small as possible, but the mantissa is not equal to zero, our formula here changes slightly. In fact, the only thing that changes about our formula is this one disappears. So this becomes plus or minus 0.f times 2 to the e minus 127. 
All right, sorry if I went off the screen there. But really, the only difference whenever your exponent and your exponent is zero and your mantissa is not equal to zero is just that this one disappears, all right? And that makes it so that we can have really low numbers. I think if there's a one there and all zeros, what is that, 23 uh, bits, so we have a zero point and then 22 zeros and a one times two to the negative 127, that's a pretty small number, right? Now, there are a couple of other special cases, and we talked about these last time, and that's whenever the exponent is equal to 255 or all ones, right? So if they're all ones in the exponent, that's as big an exponent as we can possibly have. If you have a mantissa equal to zero, what we're talking about is plus or minus infinity, right? So depending on the sign, we have either plus or minus infinity. So 255 with zero as a mantissa means we're just representing in infinity, all right? There was one more case that we talked about in episode 18, and that was 255 for our exponent, all ones, but a non-zero value for our f. So our f is equal to a non-zero value. And this was what we referred to as not a number. And it basically means that something happened, we did a division by zero or did something in the processor that resulted in something we cannot represent numerically. It's not a number. Turns out that, so, so we can glance quickly at a number and looking at this table, we can see immediately whether, well, it's, it's equal to one of these extremes. Turns out there's a number that's not so extreme that we can also represent. And that's whenever the exponent is equal to 127, which is a zero followed by all ones. So a zero followed by all ones, whenever we substitute it into this expression, 127, this is two to the e minus 127, or 127 minus 127, that makes this one. And so this becomes plus or minus one point whatever the mantissa is, times 1. And so whenever this is equal to 127, we don't have a multiplier here. We don't, have to mul we don't multiply by any powers of 2. So whenever it's equal to 127 and the mantissa is equal to 0, you're talking about plus or minus 1. All right. And so the idea that I can quickly glance at a number and say, oh, well, zero followed by all ones. I know that if this guy is all zeros, it's one plus one if the sign is a zero minus one if the sign is a one. If this is a non-zero value, well, then it's one point something, right? One point something, which is a little bit greater than one. Well, what that means is that I can actually make a quick analysis of a value by just glancing at it using some of these characteristics here. For example, and then let me go ahead and make a little bit of room here so I can show you some of these examples. What this gives us is the ability to glance at an IEEE 754 notation, a value in that, and get some idea of exactly what it equals. For example, I could look at this number and hopefully tell right away whether it's negative or positive, right? That's our sign bit. But there are other things that I could tell. I can tell, for example, if it was equal to zero. We've already talked about the being equal to zero. It's equal to zero when the exponent is equal to zero and when the mantissa f is equal to zero. Those identify that as zero. Sign bit can be whatever it wants to be. I can also tell, we said, whenever x is equal to negative one or when x is equal to one. When x is equal to negative one, that's a man excuse me, an exponent of 127 with a mantissa equal to zero, or uh, the exponent is equal to 127, mantissa is equal to zero for the positive or negative one. The negative one is just simply a sign bit of one the positive is a sign bit of uh, equal to zero, all right? Now, turns out we can figure out some other things. For example, can I tell quickly if x is less than negative one, if it's more negative? Well, actually, it turns out there are two things. Yes, first of all, the sign bit has to equal one, but if the exponent is equal to 127 
and f is not equal to zero, we know that it is a magnitude. The magnitude is larger than one, but it's negative. So we know that x is less than negative one if e is equal to 127 and f is not equal to zero. We can also tell if x is less than negative one when e is greater than 127 and the sign is negative. F can be whatever it wants to be. This sign, this exponent of a value greater than 127 and those, those bits right there means that the exponent itself is going to be two to the something one or higher. With a sign bit of one, we know that it's going to be X is less than negative one. We can also figure out when X is greater than one. Once again, the sign bit has to equal zero. If the exponent is equal to 127 and f is not equal to zero, we know that it's greater than one. If the exponent is greater than 127, f can be whatever it wants to be. It turns out we can also figure out whether we are in these ranges here. Is x between negative one and zero or is x between zero and one? We can figure those out pretty easily. So first of all, is x greater than negative one but less than zero? In that case, what you're looking at is e has to be, well, it can be less than or equal to zero because remember, if e is equal to zero and f is not equal to zero, that was the denormalized value. And we had that different formula that we used where we had zero point f times two to the whatever. So anyway, so e can be greater than or equal to zero or less and less than 127. If e is equal to zero, f cannot be equal to zero. The sine bit, what about the sine bit? Well, remember S has to equal one. In fact, S has to equal one for, for the, all three of those top ones, all right? We can also figure out if X is in the range from zero to one, right? So X is greater than zero, but less than one. And once again, that's when we're looking at E has to be less than or equal to, excuse me, E has to be greater than or equal to zero and less than 127. So when we look at that formula, plus or minus one point F times two to the E minus 127, and this is all for single precision, what you're looking at is if E is equal to zero all the way up to, but just shy of 127, so 126, right? That would give us a, an E from negative 127 up to negative one, which means that exponent would be a negative, which means we were moving our point to the left, making it a value less than one. So, um, so, so, or magnitude less than one. So if E is equal to zero, just like up here, if E is equal to zero, F cannot equal zero because if they were both equal to zero, remember that's X equals zero. But if, if we have a sign of zero, we should be able to identify this as a value in the range from zero to one. All right. Well, let's take a look at a couple of examples real quick. All right, we should be able to take a look at these numbers and really quickly identify a general range. For example, we know automatically that this one, this one, and this one, since they begin with zero, the sign bit is a zero, we immediately know that those are positive values. So right up front, we know that they're greater than zero. And none of these are equal to zero because remember, if they were equal to zero, then the exponent and the mantissa would all be zeros, right? That means that this one and this one, we immediately up front know that those are negative. So really quick, we can classify these as positive or negative. But what about the ranges themselves? Well, let's go ahead and divide these up. This is, remember, the sine bit. And then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So let's see, I think just about there. Well, let's see. There, that's the exponent. And then this is the mantissa. Now, what we've got is E equal to 127 here, which means that we're gonna have two to the 127 minus 127, two to the zero. So right up front, we know that immediately that's gonna cancel out to one. We're gonna be multiplying by one. 
Now, what do we have for our mantissa? For the first one, we have a non-zero mantissa. So what we'll have is plus or minus one point and then zero, one, zero, zero. So it's going to be one point. So it's going to be slightly larger, not a lot larger, but slightly larger than one. So we know in this case, what we've got is we are x is greater than one, but not by a whole lot, not by a whole lot at all. This one right here, we have E is equal to 127. F, the mantissa, is equal to zero. We know that X is equal to one. This one right here, we have the opposite case. This is negative, but we have an E of 127 and we have a non-zero mantissa, which means that since E is 127, this is gonna be two to the 127 minus 127. That's gonna cancel out to one. This is all gonna be equal to one. And so we have one point and then that value here. So we know that X is just a little bit below negative one. This one right here, E is much less than 127. Since E is much less than 127, we're gonna have a value that's negative here. A value that's negative here means we have two to a negative exponent, which means this point is gonna be moved to the left possibly by quite a lot. So it's a positive value, but we know that X is going to be, since it's positive, we know that X is gonna be greater than zero. We know X is not equal to zero because it would have to have all zeros here and all zeros here. But we also know that it's less than one because we have a negative exponent there, which is going to move our point that way, all right? Similarly for this guy, what we've got is an exponent that is much less than 127. So we're gonna have a negative exponent for this too. That's going to make it so that this point moves a lot to the left. So this is a value with a magnitude much less than one, but it's negative. So what we've got is a value that is greater than negative one, but less than zero, because if it were a zero, we'd know that all those patterns needed to be zero. So there you go. Perhaps a little confusing, but what you're looking at is if you can figure out what the relative values of E and F are, along with the sign bit, you should be able to glance at these values and really quickly identify what its approximate range is.